a great privilege to be not only representing Professor Richard Sennett, a great friend and a great hero of mine, but of course to chair the Chief Rabbi. We go back quite a while, Jonathan and I. Um, we grew our beards at the same rate, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> they turned white with the same rapidity in our <laughs> jobs over the last decade or so. But Jonathan has been, for me, as for so many, a constant beacon of sense and vision in our society and in the religious environment of our society. He has been described as the most influential public intellectual in the United Kingdom and possibly in Europe, speaking from a religious perspective. And I know that the reason we are breathing in and squeezing together this afternoon is precisely because that is what he is. That is the reputation and the authority that he carries, <coughs> well beyond his own community. I treasure memories of welcoming Jonathan at the Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops in 2008, when I can truthfully say that his address, touching on ideas of covenant, which I guess will be somewhere around in the mix this afternoon, really made a transforming impact on the discourse of the entire conference and what people were working from and working with in the process of quite a difficult encounter. And I have an abiding debt to Jonathan for what he gave us on that occasion. You'll be familiar with his writings, you'll be familiar with the vision that he shared with us for our society, and like myself, you'll be eager to hear what he has to say this afternoon. And so without more ado, I'll hand you over to Lord Sachs to enlighten and inspire and enthuse and excite us. Friends, it is an enormous pleasure, first of all, to be here uh, to deliver a lecture and to convene this session on behalf of the Wolf Institute, one of the great, great uh, interfaith institutes, one of the great forces for good between faiths in Britain and Europe, to pay tribute to Ed Kessler and his team for the fantastic job they do, to salute and... Um, the, the, the person whose name the Institute bears to salute Lord and Lady Wolf who honor us by their presence here today and Lord and Lady Wolf, Harry and Marguerite, it is so wonderful of you to have given the authority of your name and your eminence to this. Uh, to welcome uh, Father Philip from the Gregorian uh, University, uh, the Cardinal Bear Center, old friends from our visit together uh, with uh, the Pope uh, Benedict uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, especially to say um, what a privilege it is to be sharing a uh, platform with a beloved friend, Rowan. Rowan and I seem to have started a fashion, because I'm the first chief rabbi, I think, to take early retirement. You are the first Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, His Holiness, he, so... Um, <laughs> So Rowan's telling me he's very worried about the Dalai Lama. So <laughs> and uh, just finally to add the last footnote on the subject of optimism, and this is a true story actually, and this will show you what the Talmudic mind is actually like. Uh, we were discussing a few years ago with an eminent uh, rabbi from Israel, an eminent Talmudist, and we were talking about the situation, and we asked him, are you an optimist? And he gave the most rabbinical reply I have ever heard. He said, I am not an optimist in the Leibniz sense that this is the best of all possible worlds. Neither am I a pessimist in the Gnostic sense that this is the worst of all possible worlds. So we said, what are you then? What do you believe? He said, I believe that this is the worst of all possible worlds in which there is still hope. <laughs> now, if you can figure that one out, you get rabbinical ordination immediately. <laughs> Friends, I will just say a few words about trust, and then we'll open it out for questions and, and for discussion. But I am very... I, there is a quote that I love from the sociologist Peter Berger, who says the following, if we take our minds back many millennia, back into the dawn of history, 
we may imagine the appearance of the very first intellectual. After centuries, during which people did nothing but rhythmically bang away with stone implements and keep the fires from growing out, there was someone who interrupted these wholesome activities just long enough to have an idea, which he or she then proceeded to announce to the other members of the tribe. We can make a pretty good guess as to what the idea was. The tribe is in a state of crisis. <laughs> so that is what intellectuals are supposed to say. And therefore, let me say, we are in a state of crisis. I think when it comes to trust, that is probably not an exaggeration. In the United States, for instance, the 2011 CNN poll showed that only 15% of Americans trust the government to do what is right most of the time. 15% down from 70% in the 1960s. Similar declines in all professions. In America, only 7% of employees trust their employers. Extraordinary, extraordinary figure. In Britain, we have seen one group of people after another Come into, uh, come into serious question, whether they be bankers, CEOs, parliamentarians, journalists, even the police, even <coughs> religious leadership, media personalities, sports heroes. There's been scandal after scandal that has undermined trust in a way that is quite serious. It's morally serious, but it is also serious in every other way. A financial crisis happens... When banks, when in, after 2008, when banks no longer trusted other banks, and therefore the supply of credit froze. In other words, it reminded us just how fundamental things that we think of as very down-to-earth, physical, empirical activities like economics and politics depend on these very spiritual, abstract, moral ideas, credit, comes from the Latin credo, to believe. Fiduciary responsibility comes from the Latin for faith. Trust is an almost religious word. It is a religious word. And yet it is that on which any economy, indeed any institution, any society depends. And therefore, at such times when on both sides of the Atlantic there is an acknowledged crisis of trust, it's appropriate to ask ourselves, Fundamental questions. What is trust? Why is it important? What creates it and sustains it? What damages and destroys it? What happens when trust breaks down? Is it mere coincidence that it has happened in so many spheres at the same time? And does this have some kind of religious dimension? And I want to begin by telling a story. It is, to my mind, one of the most exciting of all intellectual adventures, and it took place over the 100 or so, 130 years between, uh, well, we start with Adam Smith, but it very much accelerated in the 1970s and 1980s. And I find this a thrilling story. You may be familiar with it. Please forgive me if I just tell it, because I like hearing it. I like stories. So we begin with Adam Smith and the wealth of nations, and the axiom on which the market economy depends. You remember that Adam Smith famously said, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. This was the transforming idea of the 18th century but Mandeville had mentioned it, uh, Montesquieu mentioned it, but it's most famously associated with Adam Smith, that it is the magic of the market that turns individual self-interest into collective gain. And indeed, he gave it an almost mystical, almost spiritual resonance, because he called it famously the invisible as if divine providence was somehow taking our lesser inclinations and turning them into the collective good. 
And that was the central dogma of market economics. However, and of course it was challenged by other systems, communism and socialism, but what is interesting is how three disciplines came together in the 19th and 20th centuries to throw doubt on this principle. And we begin with story one, which began in 1944. There was a brilliant guy, uh, John von Neumann, who was famous for developing computing. He was involved in uh, the development of, of the atomic bomb. He was a nuclear physicist and so on. But John von Neumann's father was a banker, and they used to talk business over the dinner table. So, uh, yeah, they didn't have a rabbi there. What can they do? They should not supposed to talk about other things on the Sabbath, but never mind, <laughs> they spoke about business. Okay, so John von Neumann knew that economic theory, as it existed in those days, those supply and demand curves and perfect competition and all the rest of it, was radically inadequate to describe how people actually make financial decisions. Because the whole assumption of economics until then, which is that you can get perfect information and you can know what the supply and demand are going to be and so on, actually ignored the central fact of all economic behavior, which is that the results of what I do will depend on how you respond to what I do. And I cannot know that in advance. And in order, and, and that is the determinant. How can you act under conditions of uncertainty when you don't know how your partner, your competitor, or the market will respond to what you do? And in order to uh, create a theory that was more realistic, he created a new branch of mathematics known as games theory. And that was the 1944 <coughs> step, chapter one in the story. In 1951, somebody produced a little anomaly in games theory, which has become very famous since, called the prisoner's dilemma. You know, the prisoner's dilemma it says, the police arrest two people, honest, it wasn't me, sorry, Lord Blair, uh, but the police arrest two people, they haven't got sufficient evidence to convict them of a crime, they only have minor evidence of a minor infraction. All they have to depend on separating the two and putting pressure on but each of them to inform on the other. And to do so, they propose a deal. If you inform on the other person and the other person stays silent, he gets 10 years in jail, you go free. If you both inform on one another, you both get five years. If you stay absolutely silent then you will each only be convicted for a minor crime and you will be sentenced to one year each. Now, what is interesting about the prisoner's dilemma is that it is very easy to see that for each prisoner, the best option is to inform on the other. That means that in the worst case scenario, you only suffer five years in prison and in the best case scenario, you walk free. Whereas if you stay silent, the risk is you get, worst case scenario, 10 years imprisonment, and the best case scenario, one year in prison. So each has a reason to inform on the other. The end result is they both go to jail for five years, which is not the best outcome, because if they had both stayed silent, they would have got out four years earlier. Now, the interesting thing about the prisoner's dilemma is although it sounds just like a mathematical curiosity, what it was, was as damaging to Adam Smith's economics as Einstein was to Newtonian physics. It was a spanner in the works of market economics. Market economics depends on the idea that if we each pursue our own rational self-interest, the result is good for everyone. Whereas what the prisoner's dilemma shows is that if we each pursue our own self-interest, the result is bad for everyone. And this was the first fundamental refutation of Adam Smith's market economics. And of course, why did it happen? Because in that situation, the two prisoners don't trust one another. That is why it happened. And that began to hint at the fact 
that in the absence of trust, the market economy will not produce results that are good for everyone and may produce results that are bad for everyone. The absence of trust demolishes the case for the market economy. So, that was the next stage. The next stage beyond that involved um, neo-Darwinians. Darwin was absolutely fascinated by one <laughs> phenomenon that he observed um, that seemed to refute his theory of natural selection. Darwin couldn't work out how come there were still any altruists anymore. Can you work this out? Natural selection should select against altruists because, as Darwin pointed out, if an individual risks his life for the sake of the group, that individual is likely to die younger than other individuals who play it safe and stand at the back of the room. And the end result is the altruist should die first and eventually die out. And yet Darwin discovered that altruism was highly valued in every human society that anyone had ever come across. So how on earth was altruism uh, possible on the theory of natural selection? Darwin offered an answer, but the matter remained indeterminate until the 1970s. When the 1970s came along, powerful computers were available for the first time. And sociobiologists, neo-Darwinians, were able to test the answer to the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma says the following, that if these two criminals who got somehow persuaded to inform on one another, if they did this time after time after time, they would eventually learn that if they just both kept quiet, it would be better for both of them. In other words, if you have repeated instances it, the iterative prisoner's dilemma. The two parties eventually learn to trust one another and act for their collective good, which turns out to be for each of their individual goods. So, availability of large-scale computing allowed a uh, political scientist, Robert Axelrod, to announce an international competition for the computer program that would program a species best able to survive repeated encounters with strangers whom you don't know how they're going to behave towards you. In other words, a lot of times playing um, the game theory and the prisoner's dilemma. And this was won by a Canadian <coughs> called Anatole Rappaport, and the winning program was called Tit for Tat, which says as follows, if you meet a stranger, be nice to them then do exactly what they do to you. So if the stranger responds to your being nice, by being nice, you carry on being nice. If the stranger responds by being nasty, then be nasty. And eventually the stranger will learn that it pays to be nice rather than nasty, because if you're not, he's nasty to you, you'll be nasty to him. This is called, by biologists, reciprocal altruism. It's called measure for measure, and it is the principle of retributive justice. As you do to others, so shall, shall it be done to you. And the nice story about this is that in 1989, a Polish mathematician now at Harvard called uh, Martin Novak invented a program that beats tit for tat. It's called Generous. And generous beats tit for tat because you can work out that if you meet a really nasty person and they're nasty to you, you have to be nasty to them and they get nastier to you and you get caught up in a cycle of vengeance and retaliation of the kind that we know throughout the world. So how do you break the cycle? And Martin Novak worked out that you can break the cycle by programming the computer regularly but randomly to ignore the last move of the other person. In other words, you start being gratuitously nice, even when the person's been nasty to you. In other words, if you can train the computer non-predictably, 
but relatively often to ignore a slight. If you can train the computer to forget, you get a program that beats tit for tat. And forgetting is the nearest a computer gets to forgiving. It's the computer equivalent of forgiving. So it turns out that as a result of the 1970s and 1980s studies of reciprocal altruism, it turns out that a computer came up with the answer that if you want a good set of arrangements between strangers who encounter one another in unpredictable ways, you need tit for tat and generous, in other words, justice and mercy the basic principles of the Judeo-Christian ethic established by computer, which must, I think, relieve the almighty considerably. <laughs> so there we are. It worked. We now know, therefore, why altruism is, is actually a very effective thing, because altruists learn to get on with one another. And if you learn to get on with one another, you then take advantage of the following fact that if it's a contest, we will not go into football teams here because, you know, I have support a football team that is a permanent test of faith. So uh, <laughs> let's just talk about humans and lions. One man versus one lion, lion wins. Ten men versus lion, then the men stand a chance. So if your way of responding to strangers allows you, through reciprocal altruism and forgiveness, to construct a good, a good group relationship, you will stand a better chance of survival than otherwise. And that is the point that Darwin makes in his book, The Descent of Man. It is an argument currently being fought between E.O. Wilson of Harvard and, and Richard Dawkins of another place, whether, whether natural selection works on the basis of group selection or individual selection. But the truth is that uh, it's, it's, it, it's a fairly irrelevant point because we hand on our genes as individuals, but we survive and only survive as members of groups. So therefore, when you have a high level of trust that emerges from repeated encounters between people who learn to live together, without betraying one another's trust. If you have a high level of trust, then you have a group that will flourish, whereas if you have a high level of suspicion, fear, anxiety, corruption, and cynicism, then the group will not cohere and you will fail. We can therefore now establish, through uh, the pre iterated prisoner's dilemma, through... Um, through uh, Axelrod and, 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 and Marty Novak, the following formula, which Darwin fully understood, which is that arenas of competition, biology, natural selection, competition for scarce resources, or the market economy, competition for wealth, or liberal democratic politics, competition for power, there will only be human flourishing. There will only be human survival if, as well as competition, there is also cooperation. And therefore, cooperation must be institutionalized in society, and that depends on habits that induce trust. That, however, raises the question, where in a liberal democratic society will you find the arenas that create cooperation not just competition. And the short answer is that we need environments in which two things happen. Number one, we encounter one another repeatedly. You know, that is the reason why uh, there is more crime and more incivility in cities than there is in little villages because I am more likely to take advantage of you if I think I'm never going to see you again than if I have to meet you uh, the, tomorrow in the local shop or in the pub. Iterated prisoner's dilemma means habits of trust only occur when there are repeated encounters between the same individuals. We can therefore now say why it is that families and communities and neighborhoods 
All the things that make up civil society are the places where we learn trust, because they are the homes of the iterated prisoner's dilemma. In families, in communities, in neighborhoods, among friends, that is where we have those repeated encounters which teach us not to be ruthless with one another, but to cooperate, because ruthlessness with one another results in, 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 in consequences that are bad for you and bad for me. And those are the relationships to which, in my Lambeth lecture that, that Rowan mentioned, I called covenantal relationships as opposed to contractual ones. Contractual relationships in a contract two or more individuals, each pursuing their own interest, come together to make an exchange for mutual benefit. So there are commercial contracts that create the market. There is a social contract that creates the state. A covenant is something different. In a covenant, two or more individuals, each respecting the dignity and the integrity of the other, come together in a bond of love and trust, to share their interests, sometimes even to share their lives by pledging faithfulness to one another to do together what neither can do alone. A contract is a transaction. A covenant is a relationship. Or to put it slightly differently, a contract is about interests, while a covenant is about identity. It's about you and me coming together to form an us. That is why contracts benefit, but covenants transform. So economics and politics, the market and the state, are about the logic of competition, but covenant is about the logic of cooperation, and cooperation is what creates trust. And that is why we need a strong civil society, about which I mean, which Professor Sennett uh, speedy recovery, but he just written a lovely book, all together, celebrating those contexts in which we do come together in, in covenantal relations in which neither is seeking wealth at the cost of the other or power at the cost of the other. Now, once you define trust in this way, then you see that this is the essential theme of the Hebrew Bible. It is certainly a, a central theme of the Judeo-Christian tradition, but I'm just talking for a moment as a Jew, it is absolutely central to the Hebrew Bible. The real issue of the Hebrew Bible is how do you con combine freedom, human freedom, and order? You can have order without freedom, you can have freedom without order. How do you create them both? So Genesis begins with three stories in which God gives human beings freedom and they misuse that freedom. Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. Cain kills Abel. And immediately we find ourselves in the generation of the flood, Hobbes' state of nature, the war of all against all, the world filled with violence. So Genesis begins with freedom misused and the result is chaos, freedom without order. Exodus begins in the exact opposite point of order without freedom. The Egypt of the pharaohs, where order is secured at the cost of slavery. And the key institution that allows the coexistence of free human beings without any coercive force, a, a relationship built on trust, and, and the person who really saw this was, was Nietzsche in his book, The Genealogy of Morals, and also Hannah Arendt in her book, The Human Condition. The key institution that combines freedom and order is the act of making a promise. When I make a promise, I freely place myself under an obligation on which you can rely. And therefore, I've created an order which I have freely embraced. So that act of promising, uh, that use of language as a performative utterance, uh, God creates the natural world with words. We create the social world with words. 
and those performative <coughs> utterances and making a promise. And the act of mutual promise, where X promises Y and Y promises X, is called in Hebrew Brit, which is the Hebrew for covenant. And that is the defining moment in Judaism. That summit of the book of Exodus in Exodus 19 and 20, when God and the Israelites enter into a mutually binding pledge, a promise to act for one another and to stay loyal to one another. And the result is a covenantal society in which our trust in God and God's trust in us translates into a society in which trust is a collective property of the society in which I trust others and others are able to trust me. The Hebrew word emunah, which we translate as faith, really means trust. Abraham had faith in God when he said you will have a child. That means he trusted God to act on his promise. The Hebrew word emet, which means true, really has no connection with the word true in English. It means doing what you said you were going to do. You are truthful, but you honor your promises. When we say God is true, when Jacob says, I am unworthy of all your kindness and your truth, this means a God who keeps his promises. Someone who is true is somebody who honors promises, i.e. someone who is <laughs> trustworthy. Now, I have therefore argued for many, many years that a market economy depends on virtues that are not themselves created by a market economy and may be undermined by the market economy. Because the market economy cannot deliver without trust, and trust is a property not of an economic relationship, a transaction, it's the result not of a contract but of a covenant. Without trust, the market economy fails in the way that the prisoner's dilemma says it will fail, and the end result will be bad for all of us. Now, this is a theoretical story of ideas that I find fascinating because it's not a religious story. It involves math, biology, and all the rest of it. It's a very, very interesting story, but it actually works. And when that trust breaks down, the result is, is tragic, and we, we surely all know this. I had... Um, the privilege of knowing a man, I, I won't name him, who hurt, but was widely seen as Britain's leading industrialist over a period of some 50 years. Um, I knew him in the last years of his life. He was not a religious man, but he came to the synagogue on our Day of Atonement. That, you know, that's a day of fasting and praying, which usually does, it, it makes you feel pious for a year so you don't have to come to the next day. Of the day. But he was a wonderful man, deeply moral, who wept at our last conversation. He said, my successor is paying himself more than ten times what I paid myself, and he is destroying everything I built. And he did. That's what happens when trust is betrayed. There's a wonderful story told by Lord Seif, da David Seif, I imagine, in his autobiography, Don't Ask the Price. Marks and Spencers used to insist that their suppliers gave their employees good working conditions. There was one firm that had supplied Marks and Spencers with textiles for years and years and years, and Marks and Spencers were not satisfied with the recreational and canteen facilities it had for its workers. And it said to the supplier, you have to improve those facilities or we will cease to do business with you. The company thought the Marks and Spencers were bluffing. They had been their suppliers for decades. They wouldn't take their custom away. They didn't improve the facilities. Marks and Spencers ceased to do business with them and they went bankrupt. And that, and, and, and to take a very unobvious patron saint, of, well, I'm sure, I, I don't want to judge him harshly, but to take George Soros, you know, not our obvious first candidate for sainthood, but uh, George Soros has a very interesting story to tell about what happened to him initially when he became an investment manager. He says, for the first two or three years, my only job 
was establishing my character. People had to know that to do business with me, I was someone they could trust. He said, that is not done anymore. How is it done now? You get in the lawyers. You do these watertight contracts, and, you know, you rely on the lawyers to, to make sure that if the guy is not honest, you, you will recover your losses. The whole concept of character and trust turned out to be central to um, British industrial giants, a retail giant like Marks and Spencers, and even a, a very speculative activity like uh, investment management. Good business depends on that set of principles that allow people to trust one another. Principles like mutual benefit, honesty, integrity, fi fiduciary responsibility, accountability, transparency, equity, and so on. And that constitutes an environment of trust without which companies will fail, banks will fail, the economy will fail, and society will spin apart. But that depends on understanding the logic of the prisoner's dilemma. If we think, as we have been told so often for a half century and more, that the only thing that really matters is self-interest, does it work for you? Do, it, is it good for you? Are you worth it? If that is the only force driving the economy and, 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 and politics and that there's no area of culture that is dedicated to covenantal relationships, then the pursuit of self-interest will in the long run be adverse, hostile to self-interest. You cannot build a society on the basis of a political and economic structure alone. You need families, communities, congregations, civil societies, which run on the basis of the logic of cooperation uh, rather than competition. And those are the environments in which trust is born. Absent that, and we are in trouble. So let me end just with two quotes. One from the political philosopher Michael Walzer, who puts it very bluntly. He says, we are perhaps the most individualist society that ever existed in human history. Compared certainly to earlier and old world societies, we're radically liberated, all of us, free to plot our own course, to plan our own lives, to choose a career, to choose a partner or a succession of partners, to choose a religion or no religion, to choose a politics or an anti-politics, to choose a lifestyle, any style. Free to do our own thing. And this freedom, energizing and exciting as it is, is also profoundly disintegr disintegrative making it very difficult for individuals to find any stable communal support, very difficult for any community to count on the responsible participation of its individual members. It opens solitary men and women to the impact of a lowest common denominator, commercial culture. It works against commitment to the larger democratic union and also against the solidarity of all cultural groups that constitute our multiculturalism. So this individualism comes at a price, and it is ultimately the breakdown of a relationship, which means the loss of trust. And the person who said it most bluntly, and this is one of my favorite quotes of all, was Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, for Bertrand Russell, the great heights of Western civilization were classical Greece and Renaissance Italy. But he writes the following. In, he, in the introduction to his history of Western philosophy. He says, what happened in the great age of Greece happened again in Renaissance Italy. Traditional moral restraints disappeared because they were seen to be associated with superstition. The liberation from fetters made individuals energetic and creative, producing a rare fluorescence of genius. But the anarchy and treachery which inevitably resulted from the decay of morals made Italians collectively impotent and they fell, like the Greeks, under the domination of nations less civilized than themselves, but not so destitute of social cohesion. Lose social cohesion, lose trust on which it's built, you lose everything. In short, a culture of individualism and self-interest cannot be a culture of trust and it cannot be the viable basis of society. I've tried to put forward a very minimalist argument. I haven't said that religion understands business ethics better than business people. I haven't said you're going to be honest because if you believe that God's watching you fiddling the books. I haven't said 
you'll be honest, because religion alone has moral certainty. I haven't echoed Max Weber and said it was the Protestant ethic that gave birth to, Catholic, uh, to the capitalism, or Michael Novak, who wrote a book called The Catholic Ethic and the Spirit of Prod uh, Capitalism, and I certainly didn't mention Werner Sombart, who blamed it all on the Jews. So, uh, you know, I just, a minimalist thing, which is that communities of faith are places that are guardians of what we call social capital, of trust, because they're there to support families and communities and charities to work together for the common good, not individual good. And therefore, religious groups, together with other groups and other modes of solidarity, must work to restore our badly depleted store of trust. I think Jews, Christians, Muslims, and people of all other faiths, and of none, should join forces to bring morals back to markets, trust back to institutions. And I know that our, my own tradition, the great Jewish tradition, has always believed that business is, and the economy is a moral enterprise. Let us renew our sources of moral energy by rebuilding relationships of trust. Thank you very much indeed.